Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, uh, we are uh, on the course uh, on sustainable development planning. And today we will deal, we will deal with uh, the fifth module, module five. And before coming to the subject itself, uh, let me quote uh, uh, Gérard Lescarbeau, which is a French uh, thinker, uh, according to whom uh, disasters remain the best way to move human beings. I leave, I leave you to meditate it. So uh, the fifth module uh, is about planning and resilience, the lesson learned from COVID-19 crisis. Uh, from the African experience in dealing with uh, this crisis. That will be exposed in two parts. The first, uh, to see how African countries have uh, dealt with uh, the crisis. And second, we'll see how to uh, mainstream resilience uh, into programmatic framework, uh, which are national development plan, sectoral and uh, sectoral policies and uh, strategies and program document, project document, etc. So the first part, the first chapter is uh, about uh, how African countries have faced or have been facing uh, the COVID-19 crisis. That will be uh, presented in two sections. The first one is about the measures the country have taken. And the second one, the consequences of uh, the measures that have been taken by the, the said countries. Regarding the measures they have been taking uh, the countries, the first one is about uh, uh, to care about the patients of COVID-19. The second one is to control the spread of contamination to with the COVID-19 virus, virus. And the third one is uh, uh, to lower uh, the risk for contamination coming from outside, but especially uh, at the airport level. So what are the consequences uh, uh, of the restricted, restrictive measures that have been put in place? First, at the macroeconomic level, um, the African economy have to endure the shock um, affecting the global economy. Uh, uh, the shock providing for the, 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 the difficulty of supply and demand as a result of the pandemic. The second uh, consequences at macroeconomic level is uh, the drastic reduction of tax revenue that uh, uh, most of the country are experiencing due to the more or less significant decline uh, in business activity. The third consequence um, are represented by the difficulties of surfacing the public debt, uh, which uh, have left, led the most African countries to request its remission or a moratorium on uh, its service. In terms of health, um, it's estimated that there may be some possible crowding out effects of COVID-19 vis-a-vis uh, the classic uh, uh, pathologies, malaria, tuberculosis, non-communicable disease, etc., um, relating to the use of the health infrastructures and the, the health uh, human resources as well. 
uh, there may also be some reluctance of uh, the population to attend the health facilities because uh, of risk of contamination. And the same applies to pregnant women uh, for their routine uh, visits. On the social sphere, um, it is uh, estimated that there may be some delays in schools programs and an increase in poverty due to the difficulties of the informal sector, uh, which is composed of small traders, street vendors. And there are also risk of food insecurity uh, due to poverty, people uh, without means, but at the same time, uh, the, the food uh, channel also have been affected by the restrictions uh, affecting the, 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 the movement of the populations. So in face of those difficulties, uh, the African country have put in place um, some mitigation measure and uh, in putting in place those mitigation measures, those uh, countries who have been have infected by, affected by the Ebola fever uh, pandemic uh, have gained some experience that have been uh, useful in uh, managing uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Finally, with the exception of a few countries, notably uh, South Africa, the pandemic has not experienced the feared devastating effect. On the social plan, the easing of restriction on the movement of population, the establishment of social safety nets, and direct aid to small craftsmen have helped mitigate the impacts of the pandemic on the informal sector, the risk of social explosion. Tax breaks and other subsidies to the private sectors, the private sector have also uh, limited uh, bankruptcies. And at the school level, the adaptation of lessons to the new situation and the organization of exams taking into account health restrictions have saved the school year in many countries. Overall, it is estimated that the pandemic has almost likely increased poverty and worsened inequalities. But at this stage, uh, there may not be there may not be available uh, figures to to prove that. But we sense it. Also, the decline in the growth rate was uh, limited to 3.2 for 2020, and there is a perspective of uh, a 3% increase for 2020. Overall, the lack of social protection for a large part of the population operating in the informal sector may have contributed to deepening inequalities. So one might use this opportunity uh, to really initiate uh, some reflection uh, on, on that subject. Uh, so uh, for the next crisis, uh, the same issue may not be uh, uh, the multi-sectoral nature of the responses may in some cases pose leadership challenge sometimes creating response coordination issues this evoke deficiencies in the institutional in the institutional framework for managing disaster situations. The difficulties in planning the responses have uh, negatively impacted uh, its organization, actually the organization of the response, and sometimes have generated some conflicts of attribution. 
uh, difficulties in finding also uh, the necessary resources uh, to find the responses has been also noted uh, in many, many other countries. And in some cases, the coordination of supports from external partner has not been able to adapt to the organization of the response required by the situation. As in most of the countries, um, this coordination is uh, adapted to a normal situation. And the, the cross, um, there has been very some issues in organizing clusters as uh, recommended uh, for uh, the, managers, the management of uh, crisis uh, situation. The resolution of the challenge mentioned above could be achieved or it could be at least uh, reduced, but it could be actually achieved uh, through the integration of resilience into national programmatic document. Um, at the same time, the institutional translation of the risk and disaster management architecture into the overall national management uh, architecture. So we are coming at the heart of uh, this module, uh, which is about how to mainstream resilience into a programmatic framework, namely national development uh, plans, um, sectoral strategies uh, and policies, program document and specific uh, uh, disaster reject, uh, reduction project. So to do that, we will try to define first what is resilience, what are its components, why to integrate resilience into programmatic documents, how to mainstream resilience into programmatic documents, and what are the advantage of using the PDOP for mainstreaming resilience. So what's the resilience? Uh, this uh, concept comes from uh, physics and, the, in, and um, expresses uh, the ability of a body to return to its original shape after having suffered a shock. It's measured by the time required for this return to the initial shape after the shock. So the term has also been used in many social sciences, uh, mainly psychology and design, uh, almost the same thing, but uh, is relating to, to the mind of the people affected by social and some very tough uh, times or difficulties. But recently it has been uh, also adopted uh, in the crisis management, uh, disaster management CPR, and designate the capacity of a system or society to be able to cope quickly with a sudden disaster crisis and to restore the capacity to function and act as quickly as possible. It comprises five main interconnected phases that underpin the effectiveness of uh, disaster resilience. The first one is uh, disaster prevention. The second one, preparation for disasters. The third one, the disaster response, disaster recovery, and last but not least, reconstruction. And you can find the uh, uh, much more detail about all those phases uh, in your word handout of the course of the module. So why we come to the question, why to mainstream resilience into programmatic documents? Because by doing so, uh, we can limit uh, the damage that uh, 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 a disaster can actually cause. And by 
controlling the, the damage, we can reduce the impact uh, of the consequences of disaster on development. And uh, all those is, uh, um, how can I say, discussed and framed by the framework for action of Yogo and also uh, by the priorities of the Sendai framework for action and relating to those two frameworks, which are key for disaster management. Uh, uh, you can find some more details uh, in the handouts or on the link that have been provided uh, the bibliography. So how do uh, we do uh, when we want to mainstream uh, resilience uh, into the programmatic documents using the PDOP approach, the purpose and deliverable oriented planning approach. So we use the case of COVID-19, uh, but instead of that, we may use it for any other disaster. Uh, the, the, the methodology is uh, always, uh, I would say the same. So the first step for uh, doing that uh, exercise is the formulation of result levels. When we say result levels, uh, we talk about in the PDOP framework, work vision, impacts, and outcome. And in this framework, outputs are not considered as a, as a result level because they are uh, output are just uh, those uh, elements from which uh, the transformation uh, may come from. And uh, from the previous module, you may remember that the vision is given independently of uh, the disaster or not. The vision is something that is given for is, uh, those are long-term frameworks. So the vision is given, it's uh, independent of this exercise. But the impact uh, used in the framework of the build-up correspond to, to the human and material losses. And the idea behind that is that uh, if uh, all the resilience measures have been effective, the number of uh, human losses and also uh, the count of material losses will be reduced. So um, that's why here the impact corresponds to the human and material losses. So that can also help us define uh, the indicators, uh, the impact indicators. The outcome, which is uh, the third level of uh, results, uh, the outcome are formulated on the basis of the five phases of resilience that I just mentioned. What does it mean? That means that if all the duty bearers and all the right holders perform well at each of those phases, what they are supposed to do, then the impact on human being and on the infrastructures will be reduced. So that's the rationale for doing that. So the outcome are formulated using the phases of resilience. So if those phases have been effective, then the impact will be, uh, will be lower. And then the outputs are represented by anything, by anything that the right holders and duty bearers have to use to be effective in their uh, function during the five phases of uh, the crisis of the management of the disaster. So here in this, on this slide, I have tried to formulate uh, the outcome vis-a-vis uh, -vis each uh, of the five phases, but I have uh, uh, 
uh, purposefully left uh, the fifth uh, phase, which is reconstruction, which is, uh, it might be useful, but not as uh, concrete as it may serve our purpose here during uh, this module. So we will focus on the four uh, first uh, phases of, uh, of uh, resilience. And based on that, we have formulated four outcomes. But as you may have noticed, this is uh, a bit like uh, uh, the results we have found in the international agendas we have uh, tried to mainstream uh, in the previous modules. So when we are in face of uh, some composite uh, results, we need to split them. So this operation is also needed, needed here because without splitting them, the accountability may not be clear. The delivery, the deliverable may not be clear. So uh, by splitting them, uh, we give our chance uh, to be able to, to find what who should do what and to see why uh, each uh, of uh, the group supposed to contribute to the resilience uh, uh, to not uh, perform uh, as uh, expected. So the second step of uh, the formulation is about the formulation of the goals and deliverable links to the outcome. So the first step uh, or sub-step, let's say, to do that would be to break down, to split the outcome into sub-outcome, and then to formulate those uh, uh, sub-outcome uh, using uh, the human rights-based approach uh, framework. And once done, that is done, uh, we have just to formulate the purposes and deliverable of each uh, sub outcome. And when we have, once we have uh, our sub outcome, we need to carry out the causal analysis. And at this stage, the causal analysis will consist only uh, to ask oneself or why. Uh, each group is not carrying out uh, its role effectively or eventually what to do uh, so each group perform as appropriate. So before doing that, you need to know, you need to have an idea, a clear idea of what is expected of each of those, uh, those groups. So uh, then once you get the response to those questions, you may inevitably uh, fall on thing that needs to be used, to be consumed. Uh, so the duty bearers, uh, the right holders may be able to fulfill uh, efficiently uh, their role for having all those phases being effective. Once that is done, you only have to formulate uh, your virtuous transformation framework, which is uh, called traditionally uh, result framework, but it's not the same because the contents of the framework is not exactly what uh, you are used to. And for that, you just have to refer uh, to your module two, where you can find uh, the necessary element to uh, prepare your result framework that will be a bit of fit. So when you, you got uh, uh, the outputs that are necessary, you know which output are supposed to make uh, each group of actor effective uh, in playing this role uh, in the building of resilience. So you can finally easily integrate them uh, or in your uh, national development plan or on your, in your sectoral strategy, or even prepare a program, a disaster risk management program based on that. So what are the advantage of mainstreaming resilience using PDOP? I will not repeat it here. You have it uh, fully described in uh, module two. So 
I may advise you to refer to, to what is already written in module two about the advantage of uh, using the PDOC methodology. You all get, you get all those uh, uh, benefits. And here, uh, in addition, given the multi-sectoral nature of resilience, uh, you can use each impact uh, to put in place some coordination, institutional coordination at the impact level. And you don't have to uh, guess anything uh, as the PDOP used to say for each uh, level of result, for each output, which is who is responsible. So it brings out naturally uh, your coordination institutional uh, uh, framework. So, and that is very important to, to cope with uh, the dissonances uh, we have seen in uh, putting in place uh, the COVID-19 responses. By proceeding in this way, uh, things are clear, objective, there may not be too much discussion in bargaining who will do what. The framework itself uh, say who should be responsive of what because each institution has a concrete mission. So that's all. And um, to go deeper, um, we are suggesting to you uh, some reflection questions. And uh, for that purpose, uh, we would uh, ask you for each of the population and central administration group ask you to formulate a sub outcome outcome one on prevention in which the verb ensure is replaced by a verb which makes concrete what is expected of each of those groups so instead of ensure we may seek something which corresponds to what is expected from the specific group as far as prevention is concerned and based on that, you are expected to formulate the purpose and deliverable of the said sum outcome. And following the step given in the course, suggest two outputs for each sub outcome. The second reflection question is uh, about uh, what are the main challenges? Uh, the fight against COVID-19 has faced in your country. We are interested in knowing the challenge since we are here uh, in a, a framework that, where we can share experiences that would be good to know uh, which have been those challenges and what have you done in your country to overcome uh, the same challenge. So let me end uh, uh, by quoting some counter brief. I don't know whether it has been translated very well. Those are quotations for which you don't know it's popular quotation. The best prevention against COVID-19 is still to avoid catching it. I have changed uh, uh, the original quotation. I have changed HIV by COVID. So the original was the best prevention against HIV AIDS is still to avoid catching it. I, so I think that is still valid also for COVID-19. Thank you for your kind attention. Wishing you uh, well, all the best.